Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. In this video, I talk with Mike Mason, creative director of Call of Cthulhu, about keeper styles. There are a lot of different ways you can approach running a tabletop role-playing game, and Mike shares his perspective and experience on the best ways to do so for Call of Cthulhu. I'll jump across to that interview in just a moment, but first, remember to subscribe to the Chaosium YouTube channel, and thanks for watching. So keepering styles, I mean, there's, there's three ways or three elements to that kind of concept. The style of keeper in terms of how you interact with the players, you know, you're, whether you're their friend, their enemy, you're neutral. There's the kind of the way that you impart information. How do you portray the NPCs or the monsters and so forth? You know, how, whether do you act or not? And then the kind of the third component, I guess, is the how do you get good at it? How do you how do you know when you found your style and how do you develop into that and, and, and develop further from that? So let's go into some of these different aspects in a little bit more detail. Can you talk to us about the relationship that a keeper has with their players? There's a number of ways you can break it down, but here's one way. Okay, so role-playing started out with the idea somehow that the keeper or the GM or dungeon master was your enemy. And it was you versus the players. So you were the person personification of the dungeon or the adventure out to get the players, the, the you know, the investigators, the characters, the dungeoneers, whatever you want to call them. Very early role playing, there was a lot of that because it was, you know, it came out of war games, which were me against you on the battlefield. We've moved on a bit. And, you know, there are still games that do that very well and, and they can be a lot of fun. So it's not a criticism of that, but GM stars have moved on. So there's the opposite to being the player's enemy is to be their friend. Where what you're trying to do is, you know, work with the players to get them through. Now, this can work quite well in Call of Cthulhu because, you know, players being players forget clues or they go off the wrong track. And so, you know, a helpful bit of advice to push them in the right direction or a helpful, gentle reminder with some NPC that turns up say, hey, guys, do you remember? Do you remember I told you about the strange noises coming out of the well in the far field that you've completely forgotten about? Hey, they were doing it again last night. Why? We should maybe check out that well. What do you think? Now, in a game like Call of Cthulhu, being their friend may actually work against you as well. It's kind of like, you know, as often in life, one extreme to the other extreme isn't always the ideal situation. You want to find that kind of healthy, balanced middle ground sometimes. The style, you know, I would call it kind of neutral facilitator style, which for me, I think is personally the kind of ideal because I'm in the middle of the scale. I'm not the player's friends, but I'm not their enemy either. I'm here to facilitate the game. And at times I'm going to have a joke with the players and we're going to have a laugh. And at other times I am going to be the personification of Neil Atatep and I'm going to want to destroy them because that's the other flip side. We're only talking about really, you know, the interaction between the keeper and the players at the moment. They also, the other, you know, partly a key role of the keeper, but it's shared with the players, you know, not to forget, is about being the arbiter of the rules. You are there to be the impartial, fair-minded referee of the game. You can't be that if you are too down the scale of being the enemy or the friend. And um, you've also got to make judgment calls. Sometimes you've got to say, you don't need a role for this, guys. You can just do that. Other times you're going to be, you know, I'm afraid it is an extreme role. You know, you've said you want to climb up the mountain one handed with a broken arm, balancing, you know, six eggs on your head and fighting a shogoth at the same time. I think that's going to be an extreme difficulty. And I think we can all agree that's a fair call. So enemy, friend, neutral facilitator. I, I, I guess if you think about that as a starting point in terms of developing your style, you know, you, you, you know, it gives you, a, gives you a place to start from. So what about flavour and tone? What are some of the considerations in terms of how you present information? What do you think of when you're trying to evoke your personal keeper style? My style of 
being a games master, being a keeper, is very much draws on my background of being a theatre actor, because um, that's what I started out doing many, many years ago. Um, so if you want to be a modern day investigator, if you can track out which films I've been an extra in, you get a gold star and I might buy you a pint, but I'm not going to give you any more information than that. When I was you know, running whatever game it was, I would put on you know, a character when I was playing a goblin or was playing, you know, the bank manager in the Call of Cthulhu game or the, the cocky space pilot in a game like Traveller or something like that back in the day. So my thoughts on this do are kind of influenced by that. And obviously why I like being the keeper and the games master, because I like taking on lots of different roles. You know, I'm not stuck to just my play a character in most of the time because I'm the keeper I, I, I can do everything I can do the entire world and so I do that you know by you know mannerisms the style of talking the speed pace of talking and particularly the volume of talking getting quieter as you go around the table you know helps to kind of set the atmosphere and mood and, and so forth and so on that's all you know with voice but obviously I'm talking acting, so that's not just voice, that's my face and hands and how expressive I am. I'm trying to characterise the, the NPC, you know, um, non-verbally is, um, you know, it's a useful trick. Um, and those are the kind of things you just, you just learn, you just kind of, and you don't have to go overboard and you don't have to go overboard with accents and things like that. In fact, you don't need to use accents at all. I, I, I often find myself, hardly using accents these days. I used to do them more, but I find I just end up being a, you know, a South Country hobbit when whatever, whatever country I'm in. So, oh, oh Mr. Frodo. But it's, it's more how you do it rather than the way you do it, if that makes any sense. And, and that's, the, that's the kind of style in terms of imparting information because that helps to lock it in the players' heads because you're not just getting them to remember the information, you're getting them to remember the information source and if you're playing a campaign that can be a very useful little trick performance and an acting background is a great way to approach games but i know that there are some people who don't necessarily have that skill set or aren't interested in leaning on that skill set and want to explore running their games in a different way this is a topic that i've seen discussed a little bit online especially in reference to a lot of the modern live plays and actual plays that you can see out there do you have anything to mention for people who maybe don't want to use that performance style within their games so back when i started there was no internet and there is no way to learn how to role play right, because it was just me and my friends role playing. And we didn't know any other role players. So all we had was what was in the books and our sixth sense about, does this feel right? And it kind of felt right. But often we would, we'd have a conversation post game about, are we doing it right? Do you reckon we're doing it right? It'd feel, you know, and we, we kind of like couldn't answer it. So we just, gave up asking the question and just assumed we were role playing right. Um, it wasn't until later that, you know, uh, we started to see conventions and, and you could go to a convention and play, not only play with, you know, people you'd never met before, you could observe, you could watch other people running games, you know, watch them running the same game you run. And very quickly you understood that actually, no, we're all doing the same thing. We're all doing it right. And yeah, there are variations, but they're very minor. Now, of course, flip forward, whatever it is, you know, number of years, and we have the internet, and we can instantly, the day we learn about role-playing, that is, there's a thing called role-playing games, tabletop, we can go online and we can watch people doing it, which, you know, I didn't see anyone do it for 10 years, you know, but I can do it like that before, before I've even looked at a role-playing book or played a game. That you know, in one sense, it's really good because we get to see how accessible, how easy it is, how fun it is. And, and so, you know, that's a really, really cool thing. You know, it can't, you know, can't be, uh, you know, denied in any way. However, the converse of that is it, it can set people up, um, set an expectation that people need to be this brilliant, you know, multimedia keeper, GM, able to put on characters and voices at the drop of a hat, understand the plot 
completely in their head, know all their characters' names, know all the backgrounds of their characters and what the, what's on their character sheets and what equipment they got and when they got it and what magical items they got and what the secret curse of the magical, all these things in their head. And of course, none of that is true because all we're seeing is the video like me and you know you don't see all my notes in front of me here you don't see all my little reminders about say oh you know james must remember to tell james that you know he's you know needs a new t-shirt or whatever there's you don't see that because you're just seeing it's like watching a tv program we don't see the director we don't see the camera operators and the grips and the sound engineers the makeup artists the wardrobe that what's going on just off screen it's complete chaos, probably, you know, making what works on screen perfect. And that's the same for online, you know, live role playing in a sense is, you know, so don't don't feel you have to emulate anyone. Um, yeah, you can watch them. You can enjoy them. You can maybe, you know, learn a few things, maybe learn a few tricks and tips or see what they did. But you're never going to see the full picture because you're only seeing that much of their game. I'm saying all this to say, don't feel, you know, underconfident about this. Don't feel you can't be as good as these people on screen because you are already as good as the people on screen because you know why? Because they're just players like you. Finding your keeper style obviously isn't just something that appears immediately. It's something you need to grow into. Can you talk about how to improve as a keeper in general? How do you get better at being a being a keeper being a gm it there's no there's no easy answer and there's no one answer to it i mean well the simplest single answer i would say is just by doing it you know the more the more you do inevitably in theory inevitably the better you will get there are some exceptions you know i've played with them and you know we won't say any more but 99.9 percent .9 of people um you know as with many things in life, the more you do them, the better you get. It's the same with being a good keeper, particularly in a game like Call of Cthulhu, because you are dealing with more moving parts than some other role-playing games. You are dealing with plots. You are dealing with characters with, with distinct motivations that actually interlock in some sort of spider's web of relationships, of information and character. And you have got these layers in your head and you've got your notes, and you've got the written scenario and so on to help you guide you through that. But, you know, your job is to navigate not just you through that, but you've got to navigate the players through that. And that is a, an experiential thing. It's a, it's a facilitation. The more you do, the more kind of tips and tricks that you will personally develop for doing it. That's number one. Number two is you know, watching other people, you know, observing them, you know, while you are a player in somebody else's game, watch what they do. Now, you won't always agree with what they do or find that it's suitable for you, but you can always learn something most of the time from other pe people running games. How do they organise their gaming space in front of them? How do they use the keeper's screen or the, the game screen? How do they use dice? Do they roll them hidden? Do they roll them open? Do they do a bit of both? When do they do it differently? All these things will coalesce in your head over time to develop your style because everyone's got their own style um, and you develop your style by stealing everyone else's good ideas. It's like, it's like, it's like most creative processes. You, know, you look at what's good and you, you, know, you are influenced by what's good and that helps you to outpour your own creativity in a way. So. Yeah, th those those are a few tips. Obviously, the clearly the, the the obvious one, which I've not mentioned, is to buy the Call of Cthulhu Keepers Tips book, which you know clearly is full of all amazing kind of advice that you know me and some other you know uh, experienced people have put together. Clearly, you would want to start with that. But um, <laughs> other than that, there's a lot to go over here, and we could talk about this for a long time. I'm sure we'll come back to it at some point. But in the meantime, is there a final just quick piece of advice you'd like to throw out to people always have a notebook always carry a notebook always have a pen ideally a fountain pen because you should do it right and um make notes wherever you are 
I mean, when it's when you're driving, it's much harder. So drive, you know, get somebody else to write the notes. You shout them out. But other than that, when the note, when the idea for a scenario or how to solve next next session's game, you know, when you've you've set it up and you're going like, I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna make this happen now. They've all they've all arrived here like a session early, and I wasn't expecting it. How do I solve it? Make notes and that process will help you to work things out. 